Welcome to Speakeasy Online. It's October 2022. We've got a valiant band of poets joining in. Got a couple of messages. Uh, there's another workshop with Andy Hopkins at Telehouse this Saturday, uh, 1 till 4. Uh, just go on his blog and you can, can find the booking details for that. And it's also on a post on the Speakeasy Facebook group. Uh, so that's the 22nd of October. Uh, I think it's ten pounds to book a place, but they're really good. And uh, <laughs> nodding, yeah, the one we did on the day of the uh, symposium was great. Um, and uh, yeah, I I I I wasn't sure that I had any sort of inspiration in my mind when we got there, but he managed to tease stuff out of us all, which was great. So yeah, it's a really really worthwhile um, workshop. And then um. There's probably some other things happening. Um, most notably is on the 24th of November, John Hegley's heading back up to Carlisle to do an event with the Errant Thieves as part of the Carlisle Folk Experience. And then before that, there's a, a workshop with the Carlisle Writers Group. Uh, so that, I think that's from 6 till 7.30, and then sort of 7.30 for 8 um, is, is the, uh, the Folk Experience gig. And there's details on um, Eventbrite for booking that. And um, I think there was only a handful of spaces left for the workshop if you were wanting a, to book a place. I think that the workshop spaces are five pounds, I think. That's all That's all I can think of at the moment. There's probably some other stuff, but um, yeah. Any questions so far? Good to see I'm, you, Claire. I'm... Good to see you. Are you all right? You've gone off again. <laughs> I'm all right. I'm all will be revealed when I read my poem, but I'm right. all right. I'm ticking on. Good. Thank you. Okay, cool. It's good to have you joining us uh, this evening. So yeah, you've gone again. <laughs> it's always this slick. Okay, um, let's crack on. There's been a few fun and games happening on the political scene recently. And I came up with this one. It's called Dizzy Lizzy. It goes like this. Dizzy Lizzy, you were so giddy when you won the Tory leadership vote. You really think that you're the goat. But maybe the greatest calamity of all time would be more accurate. You've earned nobody's trust. This PM is a busted flush making U-turn after U-turn faster than a carousel. What kind of tattered ideology are you still trying to sell? Dizzy Lizzy, your economic plans worried all the banks. Sterling entered freefall and all the markets sank. The tax cuts you promised, as you said vote for trusts, were the same ones you blamed on the Chancellor as you threw Quasi under the buff, bus the bus. Dizzy Lizzy, it's a difficult job and you got things wrong so you confess. But you seem to think it's fine to carry on as Jeremy Hunt is cleaning up the mess. So how long can you go on for? Everyone is taking bets. Ministers are resigning. The Home Secretary had to fly with stinging criticism while you're playing political Russian roulette. Go on. Mention Putin's appalling war in Ukraine. Your popularity level is about the same. Dizzy Lizzy, you're surviving with a party in crisis. You're so desperate it would seem there's talk of a return for bungling Boris. And the forthcoming budgetary statement on Halloween will no doubt be more trick than treat. Prices are on the rise for energy. The cost of living is bringing people to their knees. Folks are worried about mortgages and pensions. And can they heat their homes or buy food to eat? Will you search while you search for cuts and savings? There's a lack of credibility. And no one's at the wheel. Why don't you call a general election? And you'll find out how people really feel. There you are. Thank you. So yeah, just a dash of politics there. 
it's it's just a farce, isn't it? Yeah. Follow that, Hazel. Yeah, it's okay. Thank you, Phil. <laughs> Um, I didn't really know what to read, to be honest. Not that I ever actually do. I meant to say I would love to go to Andy's workshop, but I have another commitment, unfortunately, so I can't make it. Um, but going back to what am I going to read tonight? I don't think I've read this one before. In some ways, it's kind of, if, if it's time limited, it's out of date, but that's nothing new for me, really, is it? Um, because it was from the Kendall Poetry Hour during lockdown, where they had the, the whole festival was online. And I was lucky enough, I managed to get to just about every one of the morning hours with, with Kim. And I can't remember who the other poet was now, which is dreadful. But anyway, um, and it it's probably needs a bit more crafting. But anyway, Kendall Online Poetry Hour. Kim tasks us, what do you want to remember from the pandemic? I want to remember spring sunshine, in spite of the shrieking breaks on society. The sun-splashed gift of a day for my godmother's funeral, the chance to revisit Edinburgh and childhood haunts, a bittersweet day trip into my past. I want to remember soft clumps of bright, white snowdrops, my excitement at discovering the first celandines, blackbird songs overlaying twittering sparrows, March hares feeding fearlessly on high ground. I want to remember what was once real life transposing itself online, work meetings on Microsoft Teams, digital training days, Zoom room events and gatherings, tribes amassing in the strangeness of cyberspace, disconnected connectedness or connected disconnection. I look up from my notebook to my laptop screen, everyone heads down, scribing, scribbling, writing. I am in cyber poetry space. Our scrib scrabbling pens running scratchily across pages in breath quiet hush, all on mute. The hallowed devotional of writers together, recalling the bright clarity of peace in a Dama hall. Well, I suppose it contrasted with yours. Didn't it? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was Kelly says it was Claire Shaw who worked with Kim on those workshops. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and they are both amazing poets and wonderful mentors. Um, yeah, I all my poems tonight seem to be about memories of motherhood when my sons were small. Well, two of them are anyway, and they were from the workshops. I think two of them were from Andy's workshop and another one was from Kerry's workshop on memoir and poetry at Borderlines. Um, so anyway, the, the first one, I, I've given it a title that comes from a Sylvia Plath poem called Morning Song. And the line I've used is, love sets you going like a fat gold watch. On the baby alarm, a telltale barking cough. I struggled up from sleep rushed to the cot to find a tiny sweaty body fighting for air, swept him up, raced to the bathroom, turned hot taps full on, prayed for steam to rise, tried to stay calm, help him catch his breath, waited for our hearts to synchronize. That's a memory of when my younger son had croup. <laughs> horrible, horrible experience. <laughs> wow, it's. I think was that from Andy's workshop where we, you know, we were saying how powerful that was, and and yeah, what a what a worry as well. What a yeah, you'd be beside yourself, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, and, and as a mother, you sort of you know when it's dangerous and and it's just like your your instincts kick in, you know. Um, yeah, and just waiting for your pulse to slow and the baby's pulse to slow. It kind of reminded me of that plath line. Um, yeah. Follow that, George. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I wasn't going to read this tonight, but because you started off with the Liz, I thought I would follow up with it. This is a wee bit contorted because it was a friend of mine who posted up a thing that was a list of contronyms, words, you know, which mean the, which can mean the opposite of the same word. The one word means opposites. So that the, she there was a list of 10 words, I think it was, apology, bolt, bound, cleave, dust, fast, left, peer, sanction, and weathered, or weather, weather it was actually, sorry, weather. And she said, I think this might be quite something to write a poem with these as the end words of the lines. So I can never resist that kind of thing. So this is, and I quite like the idea that trust is actually something which binds or can be a support uh, and can be, you know, a building term and can, uh, but can also be to be tied up. So it is time to adjust our trust. So sagging PM with no apology, can we contain the urge to bolt? All options gone, we're bound to when we must decide to cleave promises we hear and dust the future. Will Hunt be fast, a chancellor who has left leanings? Will he be a peer fellow MPs will sanction? Can his reputation weather the storms to come? That's very good, George. Yeah. Biting, I would say, the satirical <laughs> edge there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Who knows how long this is going to go on for? Who knows? Hello, Claire. Have you got a political one? Have you got something else? <laughs> I haven't got a political one. So I've literally finished writing it a couple of minutes, like in the last 10 minutes. Um, so this is the context. It's important to remember and know that I am safe and nothing bad happened to me and my house is safe. But on Monday night, we had someone break into the house and attempt to rob the house. But my friend, is she's coming to visit me at the moment and we didn't discover until the next morning that the, the door was open and been busted open. But they didn't come into the house and it doesn't seem like I live in a flat and as soon as you open the door, it's stairs. So we were up till the wee hours in the morning and we were like, oh, we shouldn't be up this late. And then the police were like, oh, they might have heard you. So it's probably good that you were up late or they might have seen the stairs. I'm like, we don't know. All we know is that they didn't come into the house. They just broke the door down. Um, so now I've got like loads and loads of bolts and wood against the door and I've got a bolt at the top of the stairs and it's all sorted. Nothing was taken. I'm fine. It was very loved upon by my friends yesterday. One friend did my food shop for me because that's what I was going to do yesterday and she brought dinner and my boyfriend's coming tonight. So a little shaken, but I'm fine. Um, thank the Lord, I'm fine. And um, I've written a poem about it because <laughs> humour is my coping mechanism <laughs> and it's called The Dumbest Burglar in Glasgow. <clears throat> in the morning we got a shock to find the locked front door unlocked. Well I say unlocked, really I mean busted, using a tool in a neighbourhood that should be trusted. Imagine my surprise when I look round the house that nothing was taken, not even a mouse. I sent my housemate off to work whilst I made the right calls and sat guard in the hall. Well, I say sat guard, but what could I do? I'm about as useful in a fight as Winnie the Pooh. Throughout the day, all the people came. Some were useful, some drove me insane. Trying to explain to a landlord that since the door is broken, insecure and unsafe, it's his duty to blooming well fix it 
and also buy a better one with chain bolts just in case. But inside the home of this story was two women with a habit of praying to God. So we may not know what exactly took place, but we know that the Lord did a miracle by keeping us safe. The weirdest, creepiest, <laughs> so much more. <laughs> the weirdest, creepiest, funniest thing is that although they broke down the door with just a swing, for some reason, they left after breaking the door. They really didn't come in. I think they forgot that you've got to still go inside the home if you want to steal the lots. I know times are harder than they were last year, yet still we're choosing not to fear. We're sorry for you, burglar, because it seems you're in a bad dance. Even the dumbest burglar in Glasgow should get our sympathies in advance. Because what you failed to research is which house you should choose. You chose an unemployed actor's pad. There's nothing here to steal except smelly jazz shoes and a tin of vegetable soup that went off in August, but I'm gonna eat anyway. Oh, and if that fails, you can steal my ukulele. So on Monday night, I got a visit from the dumbest burglar in Glasgow. I'm thanking the Lord for his protection throughout this whole fiasco. Dear dumbest burglar in Glasgow, I'm grateful for this thing. But if you try to rob my house again, I'll kick you in the shins. <laughs> no, <I'm done. laughs> I take exception to be called the dumbest burglar in Glasgow, but... <laughs> it's like really, oh, I mean, I'm so thankful. I'm not complaining. So thankful that they didn't come in. And we don't know what happened. Was all but... the wine taken? Because I think we know who might have been out that night, eh, George? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Well, thank goodness they didn't come in clear. Yeah. And that you're all right. And you, you're all okay. So, yeah. Wow. What a... You've managed to take what is quite a, you know, a really horrible experience and, and turn it into a really funny poem. So, uh, wow. That's a good coping mechanism. Cool. I'm glad you're okay. Jeanette, oh, hello. What have you got for us? Oh, I went along to win, um, Andy's workshop on Saturday because I can't go this Saturday. And it ended up being quite a privilege, as they always are anyway. But three people didn't turn up, so I had a one-to-one -one coaching session as such. It was wonderful. So I came home with quite a lot of work and a full head. Um, so this one I'll read here. It was actually from the first prompt, you know, like the icebreaker or whatever. And it was, um, yeah, the dice with the words on again. So it just said, I love the word, roll the dice. And the word I got was hellbent. So I wrote a piece and I've tried to make it into a kind of poem. And I've called it now the fall of the dice. I rolled the world, the word hell bent, hell and bent, bent hell, not heaven, straight heaven. Hell and hell, a hell of a half, a hell of a time, hell bent time, bending time. Heaven's too straight. I'll leave it hell bent at the gate. Very good. And that was just the, the warm up exercise. Wow. Use it again. Yeah. So there was another three hours of poetry after that. Yes. Yes. So I've got more. I've got more. <laughs> good. 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 So you, it's worth it's worth going to these workshops with Andy. That's definitely. Right. Definitely. Really enjoyable. And different ways of looking at things. How he thinks of prompts is just so. Wonderful and unique, I think. Yeah, it, it, it's it's the time he goes, he puts into those. It's 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 yeah, meticulous. Yeah, yeah. and the feedback's so good as well. Yeah, you know, I, I think how does he remember? I've just said that, you know. You no, know, it's yeah, very good. Well, these teachers have got superpowers, you see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. Thank you very much. We look forward to hearing some more from the workshop in the next time round. Okay. Um
Well, that's it. We're back to me. Um, this is another political one. Uh, this was from um, a couple of weeks ago. I think it was the first of the U-turns. Uh, <laughs> it's called Oh Fudge It, and it goes like this. You can rely on the same old stories from Liz Truss and a bunch of Tories. Trying to fudge it with a mini budget. Cutting tax for the rich and supposedly the poor. The pound has crashed through the floor. Offsetting tax cuts by more government borrowing means increasing inflation, prices and worrying. Interest rates are poised to rise, yet Downing Street is deaf to the cries. Things were already tough with the cost of living. People were struggling, choosing between heating or eating. This is a self-inflicted crisis in the economy. Will the UK face a rise in inequality? We'll find out. I think we're already finding out. Thank you. Yeah, it was the IMF helped me with the last line there. That, I remember now. It was the IMF had just done that statement um, about you know putting the pushing the the panic button about UK economic forecasts. Yeah. What a mad time we're living in. Hazel, do you have another piece to to share with us? I have. I think this one came out of um, the writing group that Susan um, leads at. I think it's been meeting at Mays. I haven't been for a couple of times, but um, this actually came out of a line that somebody else, I've been pinching lines again. Um, I think it might actually have been Kevin that I kind of picked his line and went with it. And I th I'm looking at this and thinking there is a structure somewhere, but I can't remember what it was. And it's not evident just looking at it. So anyway, I called it Finding My Way. Finding my way through my own life, using poetry as wayfinder, compass and map, through extreme landscapes, ice caps of grief, deep chasms opposite exquisite reefs, mountainous ranges of indescribable strife, so much to snag the unwary and traps, yet at least equal waiting, perhaps, in moments of bliss, slicing knife-like through episodes of misery, tragedy, colouring the map like old colonised globes, a liberal claiming for generous comedy, lasering skies with rock concert strobes. I reflect now as I read this not quite poetry, the mashup of metaphors, failure to probe. <laughs> I think the end needs work, but anyway, and I'd bit. love to know what <laughs> I'd love to know what the structure is. I can't remember now that I'm reading that. Anyway. That was great. Thank you. Yeah. Perhaps it's it's the kind of poem that shouldn't have a structure because it's all about <laughs> finding your way. <laughs> That's a good point, Kelly. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. I I've I've got a very short one. Do you want me to, to yeah, squeeze got, it in? Yeah, we've got two and a half minutes, so go okay. for it, Kelly. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. This is another one from Andy's workshop when uh, he showed us those sort of coloured ink blot things and mine looked like a volcanic eruption and we'd just been on holiday in Naples and Pompeii uh, so it's just a very short poem. A patient midwife. In the shimmering heat she kneels on a mat, brushes away crumbs of soil with a soft brush. The air is still, the membrane thin. What would she have done in that moment when the ash rained down? That's it. <laughs> yeah, that's very good. Have you tweaked that slightly? 
after the uh, discussion that was prompted. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I hadn't had time to type them up till tonight, actually, just before we we started. Uh, I've just been so busy. But yeah, I, I sort of I think there's potential there in those poems. I probably need to work on them a bit more. But yeah. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. And it was it was really <laughs> It was it was so interesting to get the input from um, Savannah and and Katie as well. Um, yeah, they they were they were just buzzing. Yes, yes, they um, they come on so much. They're very talented, those two. Yeah. Yeah, frighteningly talented, actually. Yes, yeah. and love lovely to see those those videos that you've um, posted on Andy's website oh. of them. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. He, yeah. Mm. he suggested which ones we got and they turned out really yeah. well. Yeah. 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 A little memento of the, the event. Okay. We're running out of time. I'll push the button. If we sign back in, then we can start again. Is that okay? Okay. Have you got another one for us, George? Yeah, I'm just saying, I usually read from stuff that's recent, but I've gone back to this, which is from way back, Timepiece, which was a collection I put together in my uh, young and reckless days, which means I was 58 at the time, but never mind. <laughs> uh, but I just like the title for this, but I haven't read it for a little time. Never Die in a Dirty Bath. Never Die in a Dirty Bath. People may judge, find wanting. Keep the place tidy, at, or at least half so, the blood will be out of place. A stain spread for you, marking. For a day or perhaps more evidence, proof of departing, the plug pulled. Empty, drained, no trace left, the bath found clean. If any proof is needed that poetry heals, that was one occasion. I was standing at the sink and I thought I could just slip my wrist here. And I thought, oh my God, that would leave a terrible mess in the carpet. What you should do is slit your wrist in the bath. And then I thought, oh my God, if I went and did it in the bath, my brothers would come in and the first thing they'd look at is say, oh my God, look at the state of his bathroom. Uh, so I thought, you can't slit your wrist until you've cleaned the bath. So then I decided to write a poem about never dying in a dirty bath. So that's my piece of advice to everybody, never die in a dirty bath. Thank you, George. There's a top tip there, everybody. <laughs> okay, Claire, do you have a do you have something to follow that or? Um, I have a poem that's um, of a different nature. Uh, where did I put it? So this one's more like, I know we're in autumn and we're enjoying all the beauties of autumn, but this one's about winter. And really coming to a place last year where I'm, normally I talk about how I just hate the cold. I'm really coming to a place last year to really come back to enjoying the cold and appreciating the winter season for being its own season in its own right, not just something I have to get through every year. And living in Glasgow, that has extra meaning. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> this is a seasonal winter. I keep thinking of all the things we see only in winter. I keep thinking of how trees in bloom are beautiful, but they're blocking the view and we'll see it all better in winter. I keep thinking how we're meant to sleep when it's dark and in winter it's dark a lot more and bears find a hole or a burrow and sleep it off. That maybe we weren't meant to have it all 24 seven, 365 days of our calendar year. Maybe we were built with rest as well as work in mind. And maybe our world, our one earth has seasons for a reason. Therefore, for those of us at least where the calendar date can make a difference to the hints of blue or gray in the sky, 
And even though I wear waterproof walking boots all year round, maybe there's a reason and a season where I'm meant to sit down. I'm just saying, I don't believe in coincidences. And so I think God must have gifted us a winter for a reason. Would it be so wild if I was a human who moved with my Earth's seasons? So if you're looking for me in winter, you'll find me a new woman. My home has become a burrow and I'm sleeping when it's dark. This new me will be embracing the cold because I do love a brisk wintry walk in my waterproof walking boots. But this new kind of humanity is actually a return to what our ancestors used to be. Some seasons are built with slower movement in mind. So until spring, look for me and you'll find me out on snow top hills, tea in tow, then back to my burrow before four o'clock because of this fresh turn for winter has told me to stop. Slow down, move with me. I have moved with this season truthfully for some time. So let me renew my love for coziness in the cold without distraction from the present and live in this comfy, cozy, seasonal moment. That's lovely. <laughs> yeah, Kelly says it might be a song. What do you think, Claire? Is there music to go with that one? Maybe. I love that idea. I think it should be. I think originally it's one of those things where you start to write it and you, you think, I don't know if this is a song or a poem, but it's going to be something by the time I'm done. So yeah, I think it's influenced some of the songs, lyrics I wrote at the time. I'd like to make a song out of a similar thing. Fantastic. <clears throat> cool. Oh yeah. Thank you very much. I'm sort of thinking of warm snuggling up to the fire on a winty, wintry day now, yeah, 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 very much, we conjured all that up, really good. Okay, Gennetto, is it from a workshop by any chance, this, this piece? Funnily enough, it is, yes. <laughs> um, another from Saturday, and this was a prompt where there were some sections from a book, and you were using the same kind of structure so that it wasn't necessarily your style you know but you could put in other words or other meanings it's okay so this one's called well I don't know whether to tell you I'll let you guess in fact I know I'll tell you somehow and I'm hoping this comes across although it's on planting it's meant to be about parenting so it's called planting conditions no plants can be nurtured equal some like a sunny patio all decked out Others struggle with too much light, and some may grow to tolerate partial shade. In particularly exposed areas, obstacles become a problem. Removing structures that cast shadows becomes a problem. Plants kept in a container dry out quickly. They grow to rely on daily watering. To recap, no plants can be nurtured equal. Should obstacles become a problem, exposed to light appropriately, Water gradually abandon the, the container. Fantastic. That was, yeah, that was good. Uh, you must have come top of the class in this uh, workshop. <laughs> the only one there. And you should have seen the competition. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Thank you. All right. Oh, uh, yeah. Back to me then. Um, I found some. I found my notes from the symposium workshop, so I can read some of those. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. This is this is this. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I remembered the one, the three words I got when I rolled the word dice were uh, gorgeous, ground and bump. And the sentence, he said to put them in a sentence. And I came up with, you were looking gorgeous right until you hit the ground, bump. So that's that little, little bit there. That was the warm up exercise. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and then um, uh, we got objects with smells from them that 
stimulated uh, memories and things and I got this peppermint tea bag and I um, came up with this one. From a pocket were produced endless bribes to trudge through a rainy lake district. Polo mints. A high price to pay when you are seven. Promises of the end in sight. Just round this corner. Vow to go to the summit, but no further. Powered by packed lunch. Chocolate mint biscuits wrapped in green foil. And, on a successful return, a reward after flagging down a lazy, trundling ice cream van. There you are. Thank you very much. Yeah, I really don't know where all that came from, but it was what was conjured in the, uh, you know, when he goes, I think we'll put five minutes on the clock, and you're like, ah! minutes to write a poem ah! <laughs> and everyone else is scribbling down and I'm there going ah! <laughs> looking around the room going what's meant in here I don't know I'll have to think of something just don't panic just think it'll be fine it's rather like the Muppets in my head <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think the adrenaline rush does help you access those memories. You, you know, you panic and then some, suddenly something comes into your head. Like, you know, those were clearly very vivid childhood memories for you. Um, yeah. yeah. It, it was like the uh, fight or flight response. You're like, oh, I've only got those left. Uh, <laughs> write those. Okay. <laughs> uh. Uh, less of the uh, psychoanalysis. Hazel, uh, what have you got? Well, you have reminded me, though, those poems that came out of Andy Workshop, it's lovely to listen to them again. Um, I've forgotten about mine from the last one, but what I have got is one from an earlier Andy's Workshop, um, and I, I can't even remember what the prompt is for this one, except I think what he did was read a poem that one of his one of his to you know one of the school kids had written and i think that's that's what we kind of took the words of the the poem that he gave us and were meant to do something with it so um i led it i started mine well wtf is the polite version or a naughty boy does this abstractionism or maybe something similar. In his words, similar to a triangle, yet wine bottle shape too. Large at the bottom, smaller at the top, sloping inwards, vibrant purple, yet lighter and darker, bright red and black. He says, a dark night. I don't see it. His title, proper paragraph, doesn't help and that was it it's a bit of nonsense really but <laughs> yeah it's interesting when you look at someone else's writing and what you sort of critique from it and and things isn't it yeah yeah that's that's probably quite a clever little prompt actually isn't it yeah Nonsense is my favourite genre. Oh, Claire, yes. You're welcome here. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, Kelly, do you have a, another for us? I do. And um, and this comes from Kerry Derbyshire's workshop at Borderlines. And I'm, I'm still working on it, really. But she gave us some wonderful lines from poems as prompts. And the prompt for this one was, I had always loved being high over cliffs. Um, I can't remember the name of the poet, but anyway, I took that as the beginning of my poem. I haven't got a title for it yet. I had always loved being high over cliffs until we came to live in a house where the windows rattled and the sheep in the field cried like hungry babies 
their bleats snatched from their mouths. That autumn, I was all at sea, a new mother leaking milk and tears, my older child in hospital. A kindly neighbour drove me there to hold him, read him roll dull, while we waited for the doctors to set his broken arm. After a sleepless night, I returned to the house, still rocking in a gale, held my baby son to my breast for hours until the milk flowed again. Finally, he slept in his crib and I slept too. Next day, the wind had dropped, the sheep were quiet. Thanks. <laughs> Another traumatic experience of early motherhood. Yeah, we'll get, well, there's all some trauma coming out tonight from everybody, isn't there? Yeah, wow. It's, it's, they're so powerful, those pieces, aren't they? yeah it's it's good to know that they have an impact you know whether or not you've kind of had that experience you know I, I think women who've you know who've had babies kind of relate to them particularly strongly but but perhaps everyone has that feeling of being all at sea sometimes when everything's falling apart and you know there's, there isn't just one crisis then another one happens as well <laughs> yeah yeah, that almost brings us back to where we started with politics. Anyway, um, thank you, Kelly. George. Thanks, Phil. I'm, I'm difficult to follow this, and I'm also in a, the stuff that you come out with at workshops, all of you is brilliant. Uh, this, is, this obviously, you're going to realise that this comes from, from years back as well, because this is uh, just a bit of fun, hopefully. Not usually my style to have fun and play to, but we'll do this. 40 years an idiot. 40 years an idiot, 18 years a fool. You'd think that I'd know better, but life is very cruel. It takes a special person to rise above the storm. Pity I had lead boots given when I was born. They kept me on the ground when my spirit wanted flight. It's hard to be creative when nothing will go right. When your body moves like Frankenstein, knitted you all plain. When your face looks like a jelly bean someone stepped on in the rain. There's only one thing you can do when served a bowl of bile. You know the world will laugh at you. Better to make them smile. Here I am the joker for life is very cruel. Forty years an idiot. 18 years, a fool. And yet there's so much wisdom there, George. That was great. Are you going to read that one when you come up to the, the symposium as the headline act? I'll need, to, I'll, I'll, need to, I'll need to think of another 15 years to add into it, though. I'm not quite sure. 15 years of Pratt. <laughs> 15 years of poet. Thank you, George. Claire, do you have another one for us? No? Do you want to sing us something? <laughs> no, you, there's no pressure. No, no. Thank you. That's right. You, Thank you, though. I actually haven't played in front of people in ages, so. We won't tell. <laughs> cool. With what you've shared tonight, it's been great. So thank you so much for, for those. Um, all right. Jeanette, oh, hello. Do you have another one for us? This isn't from a workshop, but it nearly was. Um, and it might have sound, sounded better if it had. But it was, you know, for the Kelly Derby, she won Kelly. She asked us to take along a photo or something with a memory. But the prompts that she gave actually led me somewhere I wasn't expecting to. So I've tried to write this one since. But what I did bring was this um, little nursery rhyme book from when I was little. Um, so this is a work in progress, really. But the title is... And you never winced, nor told me I couldn't sing. 
I've lost it. There we go. That wasn't part of the poem, by the way. I just lost the poem. <laughs> I'll start again. <laughs> and you never winced nor told me I couldn't sing. With a flick of wholemeal toast crumbs into marmalade lime air, I'm there beside you. A little girl with a little curl curled up close on candle wick with this book. A ladybird book of nursery rhymes that close mornings turn too soon. Its edges are worn and felted, its spine has lost its name. Yet inside the front cover, your hand remains the same. You clear your voice with coffee, marvel with mellow birds, porridge hot or cold. We'd sing, merry as King Cole, we'd sing and laugh. And at what a little boys are made of, you always let me up. You always let me laugh. Two little dicky birds, one day one did not come back. But here within this loft space, here within this book, fingers join and trace your name. Your hand with love remains the same. Thank you. Thank you. That was, yeah. That was a really uh, a lovely piece. Yeah, really, really lovely. It just shows when you do read it aloud, you realise where your stumbles are, don't you? Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you <laughs> for uh, being my uh, guinea pigs there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny when you write something and you, you can sort of think, oh, when you just see it, as you say, just see the words, you think that's fine. And then, yeah, when reading it out, it's something... It's quite different, isn't it? Yeah. So you've had that book a long time, then, have you? Yeah, uh, yeah, it's quite old. <laughs> and there's a little sign, you know, inside. In fact, it says a present from Scotland from Nana with love to Jeanette. Kiss, kiss, kiss. Oh, wow. Yeah. A, a treasure. Yeah, but, you know, as soon as I opened it, you know, you remember all the pictures and, yeah. this lovely. I just saw the two little dicky birds there. Where are they? There they are. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Favorites. <laughs> and and something like that, you know, it, it's so powerful. It you know probably played a part in giving you your love of words and you know the fact that you're a writer now. Yeah, well, she always she always used to recite poetry, and I remember her. Um, a slave's dream. She couldn't see it. You know, the amount of time she recited it, but always cried. Always cried, yeah. Wow. What a lovely, uh, well, yeah, what a lovely tribute to, to uh, you know. Thank you very much. Was... Wow, there's been some sharing of amazing stuff. Um, are we okay to go around again? Is that okay? Yeah? Okay. i got another one here. Hang on. Um, yeah, I got a, uh, I got one of those, uh, sort of Rorschach style splodges from, from Andy in that workshop. And, um, uh, it looked a bit like Pikachu had met his end, uh, in an accident, uh, on the road. So I had to come up with something else because I was just seeing these yellow and red splodges and it was like, uh, so I came up with something else. Wasps and bees swarm over gloopy spillages. Custard and splatterings of trifle dropped. It met the ground in a violent volcanic flux. As goldfinches swooped down to snatch raspberries from the desert debris. Butterflies ballet about cherries. Moths flit. And you decide to have a banana instead. That's that's that one. Thank you, thank you. That's um, yeah. It's probably a, a moral for us all uh, in that. Um, Hazel, would you like to share another with us? I've got one that actually is. Um very old it, literally well it's 20 years old um kind of a found poem 
made up of fringe titles. So it was called A Stroll Through the Fringe Shows, very originally. Anyway, cellophane singular, check your coupon, breakfast not included. The bald prima donna was Brahms and Liszt at midnight. Elegies for angel punks and raging queens from Ibiza to the Norfolk Broads raised a chorus of disapproval from the rhythm sharks and the ski sluts from Glen Shee. My umbrella is a balloon too, pear-shaped after midnight. I love you, you're perfect, now change. Did you used to be R.D. Lang? Read out, I murdered him. <laughs> so there we go. Bit of, bit of silliness. <laughs> Fantastic. You should have your own fringe show. I look forward to it. When can we book ticket? Book it there. Okay, um, Kelly, do you have another one, or are you rushing off for your dinner? Because I know it's getting a bit late. I know, you know, it's like dinner time. <laughs> Actually, my my husband's away, so my dinner is according to my own schedule. <laughs> wow. <laughs> So I will stay online. Um, I hadn't I hadn't got another one ready, but I've I've got I had a pile of poems just here. So uh, apologies if you've heard this one before. <laughs> um, if Emily Dickinson were my best friend, I'd visit her in Amherst, climb the wooden stair, and knock gently on her bedroom door. I'd ask her to tell me her secret, how to distill 200 words into 20, how to capture a truth before it slipped away. I'd tell her the sun was shining, book two tickets to Paris, take her to the Musée Rodin, suggest she unpin her hair. We'd go to a bar in Montparnasse, drink gin and tonic from big glasses, talk about how women's lives had changed and not changed. I tried to take away her sadness, even though her sadness made me love her. I'd ask if she knew she'd become an icon, if that was what she wanted. Then I'd take her back to her room, make sure she had all she needed a jug of water, a Bible, a notebook and pen, a choice about how to live and when. Excellent. Wow, really good. Thank you for sharing that. Thanks. I wrote it a while ago, but it it's one that makes me feel happy, so I thought it'd be a good one to share. <laughs> yeah, thank you for sharing. That was good, really good. All right. George, have you another one for us? Yeah, thanks. I'm always surrounded by players, but I wasn't going to read this tonight, but this is for Claire. I don't know if you can see that, Claire. I don't know if it doesn't come up. That's Glasgow. It's a pamphlet that I've been working on. I had been working on it and I shelved it because just things move on. But uh, this is actually, this poem actually will hopefully be in the collection coming out, which I hope will be with Cinnamon next year. But it's for Claire. Well, it's for you all. It's a Glasgow hug. The city breathes in. He feels its hard edges, the surge of night streets. At the corner, he ponders roots home wonders. How many are making tea, spoons clinking on saucers, how many are in bed, curved in love. He is grabbed in a bear hug, swung from his feet by a booze-happy man who leans closer. You remind me of my dad. He smiles, nods, feels the warmth. My dad, the voice cracks, is in a hospice, dying. He watches the man roll on, swirling away in that tide of night, 
whose voices haunt him, lanes pull at his fears, that fissures threatening to suck him in. Laughter echoes from somewhere, and he wishes it was his. A sweet memory in his tongue. He wants to join the revelers, wants to belong. Uh, yeah, beautiful poem that George. But the bit about the guy that actually happened to me, mm -hmm. I was standing at a bus stop and a guy charged up to me, grabbed me in a bear hug, and swung me off my feet. And actually, before poetry nights, I would have been terrified. But to be honest, he started. I just started laughing, and he started laughing. Then he said, "You remind me of my dad." And I thought that's really nice. Then he said, "He's dying in a hospice," and I thought, "Oh my God, I remind him of a dying man." <laughs> I didn't read him the one about the bathtub, though, did you? <laughs> but he was lovely, and his mate kept shouting, "Put him down! Put him down!" <laughs> 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 and he's gonna dance the range. <laughs> Oh, so it was a lovely night. Does it happen? Does it happen a lot in Glasgow, Claire? All the time, I bet. I've seen some strange things. You know that that wouldn't surprise me if I saw that. <laughs> oh, fantastic! Thank you, George. Uh, Claire, you're, you're, well, you're next on my list, but we've already established that you, you, you're you poeted out. I, well, I have a thing. Oh, okay. Um, it's political. I do have a political thing. Um, I wrote it as like a satirical news article. Um, you'll see, you'll be able to guess when exactly I wrote it. Because it's called, <clears throat> it's, so it's titled New Government Announcement on Tea. Lizzie Truff has suggested that they hark back to the glorious war times by rationing our cups of tea and who gets to wear the jumpers. If you're holding a hot cuppa, you don't need to hog the jumper, is the new slogan being pushed by the Bourbon Party. The idea is that British citizens limit themselves to one hot drink a day in the winter to avoid turning that pesky kettle or hob on too many times a day. The solution for multiple person households is to vote on a time of day to have said cuppa and then stick to it. The Bourbon Party believe that with enough effort, they can get British homes back to those good old war times with ideals such as save kitchen waste for pigs. The announcement came from Lord Chancellor Mr Bandon Lewisham, who encouraged us commoners to cut waste and inefficiency by sharing socks simultaneously and turning off fish tank filters at night. His full list of proposed cutbacks can be found on his blog, integrityisexpenses.com. Whilst giving the announcement, the Right Honourable Fellow was recorded wearing not only a jumper, but a coat and a scarf as well. When questioned about this, the minister argued diplomatically that the ones running the government should be allowed to wear more layers because the government is a cold place to be. Keep calm and ration on. You realise that's the energy policy for uh, this winter. I know, I want to say it's all a farce, but it, yeah, it is all a farce. <laughs> yeah, but we're living in it. Uh, oh, that was good, Claire. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, well, that's another public public service announcement there. Very good. Uh, Jeanette, do you have another? Yeah, I've just been frantically looking through my phone to see what I've got, and I'm going to be brave. <laughs> And this was my borderlines entry. I just like to enter each year just because I can and it gives you a prompt to write. So this is called Learning to Listen. The crack of a smile as dawn flutters feathers. A swoop of swallows acknowledging clouds. The lilt and lap, the thrum of rain. The glint of a wink, cooked air as hands meet. 
the soft pull of bread to a shaking of laughter. Concrete footsteps, sparkles in standstone, to the drying back of an old pine tree. Unbuckling shoes, releasing laces, anointing feet with beaded grass. Uncrossing blades through dusty foliage, to the slough of sand, the lap of blue. By lull of moonlight and swarm of stars, inhaling echoes, exhaling hollows, an embracing breeze to a steady stack of pebbles. The silence of sinking into insignificant solitude. Wow. Amazing. I like that a lot. Thank you. Fantastic. Did you say, um, did you see, uh, was it Brian Bilsden you saw at um, Borderlines? Yes, yes. I was like walking on air because he recognised me. Because down in the cafe, he was on a table next to us. And I, thought, oh, Brian and I did get chatting to him between at bookends and cakes and nails, but hi Jeanette, how are you doing? And yeah, so I was like a bit starstruck. <laughs> That's brilliant. Probably recognised you from all those uh, poetry, uh, online poetry um, competitions and everything you're doing, you and George. And... Yeah, well, yeah, I did once message him in the early days, you know, when he was first on Twitter with his hype and everything. Um, you know, so there's a couple of messages, but I never thought he would remember me. But he's such a lovely, lovely bloke. He really is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We, I, I went to it as well with my husband Ian, who, believe it or not, he used to work with Brian Bilston, so he he knows his real name. <laughs> oh, to say. I, I mustn't tell anyone. Um, but but they used to work together in a publishing company in Oxford. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, so, so my husband Ian knew him a long time ago and he, he's always been a really nice bloke, very modest, very sort of likeable and pleasant. And, and I don't think he ever expected to get so famous, you know, but social media has been the key to it partly, I think. But, and, and I mean, you know, he is brilliant, but the way people share his poems on Facebook and everything has made him very famous. Um, and he deserves all his success. He, he brightens all our lives, I think. Do as well. I said that to him. I said, you know, you've done it ever so well. And he said, he said, oh, it's thanks to you retweeting everything. <laughs> <laughs> And and actually, some of his poems are quite serious and political they are. as well, aren't yes, they? Yes, they are. Yeah. Yes. Very clever. Mm. Yeah. Cool. But yeah, he, he remembered my husband, even though they hadn't seen each other for kind of over oh, 20 that's years. Nice. So that yeah. was nice. Yeah. So did your husband remember him as a bit of a stationary thief as well then? Because <laughs> that come, <laughs> comes out I, I, in the <laughs> He, he never mentioned that, but I'll ask him if, <laughs> if, he, if he did. I just remember that. there's a section in Diary of a Somebody where he's, he knows he's going to be made redundant, so he goes to the station cupboard and fills his pockets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think we're about to time out. <laughs> Click on the button to sign back in if we're okay to maybe do one more round. Is that okay? Uh, I, I think I, I will That's sign okay. off now. But... That's okay. Thank you for but coming. Thank you very much. It was such a lovely evening. I really enjoyed listening to everybody. All right. Are you up to going around maybe one more time? Is it okay? And then well, I'll, I'll let you go. <laughs> get, get on with your evening. Oh, once you get a poet started, you never get them stopped. So we well, that's that. what I, I do. I, I, you know, it's like letting the genie out of the bottle, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I always love the people who summoned last night. You know, they say, can I just do one more? And the person nods. And then they do the longest poem that they've done all night. Yeah. And they spend five minutes trying to find it while they chat away, talking about everything that's happening. And you think, sorry, which bit of you was thinking? <laughs> yeah, we've all been there. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. But yeah.
yeah, uh, Borderlands was good. The events people got to at the Borderlands, yeah, 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 very good, very good. Yeah, I would love to come down to some things, but I had to decide to mm. some extent, and I decided to come to the symposium, which was, I think, mm. the week before. Yeah. So, yeah, and I meant I could meet a number of people, which was great. Yeah, it was so good to see you at the symposium, George, because it's, been a, it's nice. been a while since we've uh, seen you in real life. You've been to a couple of the symposiums before. You've been to some at the um, Phil and Lit Society, hadn't you, um, when it was raining? Yes. Yeah. yeah, but also uh, Brantwood fitted in in some ways, but Brantwood was cancelled for this year, so I'd been hoping to go down there, and I would have been this month, I think, with with Geraldine Green and Pippa Little. Yeah. Uh, so I, I feel quite at home in the north of England. About <laughs> hopefully they feel the same about me, but I like it down. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're always welcome. Yeah, always welcome here. Yeah. I'll just mention there's a nice launch next month uh, with uh, Alex Corinne Tab Tabanaf. I've forgotten her saying now. Look out for the book. She's a lovely girl. And it's a collection that's come out just, just now. And they're doing a launch over in Newcastle. I've forgotten the actual dates now. I think it's the 5th of November. Is it the 5th? That sounds wrong. That's from Guy Fawkes now, isn't it? Mm. Mm. Well, uh, you can always post something on, on Facebook if you... Uh... Yeah, I'll just... It's the 11th. Oh, okay. 11th of November. Okay. All right. Um, cool, 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 cool. All right, yeah. We'll, uh, we'll make another uh, start, this last little dash round. Um, this is this is one I was asked to um to go along to an event they were doing uh, in Denton Home um uh, about food and uh, helping people um with um with the cost of living crisis and um uh, trying to educate people about uh, how uh, you know home prepared food is probably cheaper and better for you than um, process stuff you pick up in um, fast food uh, joints and things and um, takeaways and things and um, some other bits and pieces um, and they said oh would you read a poem for this event and I was like uh, okay I'm not really sure <laughs> but something came into mind so um, so this is it this is food for thought we're in a cost of living crisis with increasing inequality and rising prices. There's an obesity pandemic sweeping the nation, but people have to eat. It's more complex than just all in moderation. Although that is a key part, but what's really at the heart? Who is to blame? The nanny state? Labour? Conservatives? Additives or preservatives? The usual suspects. Fat, sugar and salt, are they all at fault? Take away delivery apps, make ordering in all too easy. Sat with tubs in your laps, don't all those endless e-numbers make you feel really queasy? Whether you're watching the pennies or worrying about piling on the pounds, just take a walk, little but often. You don't need to go running marathons. A rule of thumb for a healthy living guide means cutting out junk food, fast food, and stuff that's fried. Refined sugar, too, is hard for the body to digest. Nature is way ahead. Fruit and veg is best. And water, too, is healthier than Coca-Cola, better than teeth damaged by fizzy drinks. Coffee and tea feed our caffeine addiction. Too much wine and lager means soon your clothing shrinks. Another elephant in the room is, of course, meat. Alternatives come from corn, mushrooms, dairy, wheat. Avoid too much saturated fat, processed salt and sugar. Remember to exercise, burn calories, cleanse the toxins with vim and with vigour. 
Save the planet. Save power. Save money. Save today. Save tomorrow. It's time to confront those deadly sins. Make an outlaw of gluttony. Take responsibility for just what fills your gut. No trips through those golden archways. Avoid Burger King, Nando's, finding yourself in Pizza Express, or was it Pizza Hut? Maybe have fewer takeaways, drive throughs and buckets of deep-fried chicken. Tap into your culinary magic by concocting delicious feasts in your kitchen. There's a whole world of experts and recipes. Find out tips on the web and from chefs on TV. We can make food go a long way. Info is just a click away. Help is here. Hope over fear. You don't have to be wealthy to live and eat healthy. More home cooking's the solution with groceries that are bought. That's something to consider, to coin a phrase, food for thought. There you are. So I think I was on message, so it was all right. <laughs> cool. All right. Um, Hazel, do you have one to follow that? Well, I don't know about follow that, although there's a part of me thinks, can I borrow that poem for some of our patient groups? Yeah. <laughs> they might be really amused. <laughs> got some really nice, anyway, that's aside, completely aside, but definitely on message in a really entertaining way. So I'm going to bring the mood to something else now, just because I don't think I've read this one. Um, and actually, I think this came out of that Kendall Poetry Hour thing, um, if I remember rightly, which may or may not be right. It's called Awakening Grief Afresh, and that's my phone just going off as well. Um, Awakening Grief Afresh. For a long time, I believed grief had lain down, slipped into suspended animation, but it's merely been in hibernation. Like the first shoots responding to Imok's quickening, new death awakens, the bulb of sorrowing, shakes off torpor, bright new, sh bright new shoots, spearing, spearing your heart afresh. It's very short, probably just as well. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that was you know, a very powerful end, last line there, spearing your heart afresh. Yeah, it's, it's, grief, it's, it's grief such a difficult um, thing to process, isn't it? It just creeps up on you when you're not realising. You think, oh, after a period of time, you think, oh, I've got over something, and then it can just, the smallest thing can just bring it back. It's tough. But, um, Uh, George, do you have another one for us? Yes, I do. Actually, I was about to look up something about when you mentioned about small things bringing grief back, but I can't, I'll not do that, just uh, probably better sticking with something cheery. But I was just watching something the other night, I think it was actually Gogglebox or something like that, and it, it just suddenly struck me that I was sitting in the couch alone, uh, which is stupid because I'm sitting every night in the couch alone, but... It was just watching other couples and you suddenly go, oh, right, yeah. Anyway, but this is a cheery thought, but this is coming from the this timepiece thing. So hopefully this maybe makes you smile. It used to make me smile. Elephants can dance. When happiness seems to have no chance, there is a thought to keep you sane that whales do sing and elephants can dance. When fates conspire to make you wince, remember luck can join the game when happiness seems to have no chance. When devils round your head do prance this thought, will all their madness tame that whales do sing and elephants can dance. 
when nightmares make you look askance, remember fates can turn again when happiness seems to have no chance. When troubles taunt with fiery lands, this thought will soothe the writhing brain that whales do sing and elephants can dance. So set your joyous self to prance, cheered that hope is not in vain, when happiness seems to have no chance, for whales do sing and elephants can dance. I love that. That's brilliant. Is it Fantasia with the animated elephants dancing, or is it? Yeah. No, it's not elephants. It's hippopotamus. Is it oh. not hippopot hippopotami? Is it? What's the plural? Hippopotamuses. <laughs> right. Yeah. I think it's hippopotamus and no elephants. Might be. Hazel's looking questioning there. I think maybe I'm wrong. Well, no, I was going to say, does it? Is it not both, or am I just now? Well, maybe there's both. <laughs> I, I can't think. I just, I just always like. It made me smile when I thought about it, and I thought mm. it is certainly true that whales sing. And I thought so. Maybe somewhere in the jungle, there's a, a herd of elephants kicking up a military two-step or doing a quick <laughs> tango. Tango. <you know? laughs> <laughs> it's that thing, you know, in the, that I went to a Loch Winnacol at the time, and I wrote that collection called uh, A Year of the Loch and one time I looked out in the loch and it was that thing with the two swans and I think probably they do it quite often where there were beautiful silvery whites floating in blue water and then they formed that heart with the two heads coming round mm. I would just sort of you look at it and you think they, this, it's got to be staged, they must know they're doing this you know <laughs> Probably, they probably have a conversation. They go, there's a bloke coming, there's a bloke coming. Let's do that routine we worked on. Okay, here he is. Yep, do the thing. Just real real cool. Like, <laughs> Mind you, I used to think that the only thing that kept Warburton's afloat was all the people, because people would turn up with, with whole loaves. I mean, not, <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. Like, they, they, not just the ends or anything like that. I mean, I feed the birds, but I feed them with the slices that have gone stale. These people would come and open up a brand new loaf. And there's signs all over the place, you know, that says, don't feed this bird's bread, it's bad for them. And the birds are all standing there, you know, like alcoholics going, yeah, chuck us the bread, mate, chuck us the bread. <laughs> Do you think people are like, I'm going to I'm going to feed the ducks, and then they're like, "Oh, I'm brought any bread with me. I have to go and get some bread from the <laughs> shop on the way there." And they don't sell slices. <laughs> I watched the woman once open a packet of loaf, and she had a wee girl with her, and she start, she took the bread out, and she stood with it out in her hand, and then she got attacked by all the seagulls before she could throw it to the ducks and swans. <laughs> So she ended up, she's running for the car, dragging this little girl behind her. But she's still hanging on to the bread and couldn't understand why. There's these seagulls that are still dive bombing her as she's trying. <laughs> oh, dear. Who is it? Is there a sketch? Is it Mr. Bean or the Monsters or something when they try to feed the ducks and they just throw the, the loaf of bread and it just like takes out a duck, I think. <laughs> They're like, what? <"Well>, done that. <laughs> Oh dear. Jeanette, over to you. I'm just thinking here, you know, if there's such a thing as reincarnation, I'd be no good as this one because I haven't got the coordination <laughs> so much. Uh, anyway, just a short, 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 a short one. I was chuffed to get this in the post this week, South Light 30 from north of the border, and um, I have a little poem and a little drawing. Well, it's a, a pen and ink from quite a while ago, actually. Anyway, the poem is called Reading Girl, and the, the drawing, pen and ink, whatever, painting, whatever you call it, it's a, a sculpture in Manchester Central Library, which is one of my favourite places, and the statue's called Reading Girl. Anyway, she reads, it expands her mind and takes her on journeys she couldn't imagine. She learns 
joins others' minds, becomes part of the world where her thoughts fit. Short and sweet. <laughs> That was beautiful, beautiful, beautiful poem. Fantastic. And it's been published in the South Light magazine, yeah? Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yes, very well chuffed. Cool, cool, cool. That's excellent. Thank you. And quite rightly, yes, definitely, you should be in there, yeah. <laughs> Have you sent that... To the museum, you say there's a library in, in Manchester. Oh, sorry, the um, the statue is yes. Yeah, maybe. The um, the the drawings are, yeah, it's of you can see it. I don't know. It's, uh, yeah. Oh, I'm going to see. I told you my coordination is rubbish. I'm going the wrong way. Well, it's does it's yeah, designed she's... to trick you. This you see, it's designed. Oh, that's great. Uh, you should send it to the uh, to to the. Uh, uh... They should yeah. show them in Manchester. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there's an excuse for a trip. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like you need an excuse. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, that's been a very thorough evening of poeting for everybody. And uh, uh, thank you all for joining in. So give yourselves a round of applause for, uh, for reading and, and listening. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Lovely to see everybody. Well, thank you for tuning in, and uh, it's been great. Yeah, really good. So, um, let's say there's a um, there's an in-person speakeasy next Wednesday at the Source. Um, so there's no excuses for not uh, being there, George. Um, <laughs> uh, I should offer Claire a lift down, shouldn't I? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we'll make it happen. <laughs> I would love to come, but we're, I'm away, so I can't. I'll hopefully get to the next one. Okay, okay, we'll let you off. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming along, and um, yeah, uh, really good stuff. Um, keep safe and well, and um, yeah, hopefully catch up uh, again soon. And I hope the COVID drags, dregs are thrown off soon, Phil. Mm. I hope so too. I hope so. It's just. Uh, I've got things to be doing, you know. <laughs> it's like I can sort of psych myself up for one day, and then the next couple of days is usually a bit. <laughs> so it's getting there, getting there. Fun and games, eh? Fun and games. Anyway, take care, and I'll see you next time. See you Thank soon. You. Thanks. Everybody. Thank you. Good to see everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.